In our past episodes of Breach, we've travelled to Northern Africa, then all the way to the frozen depths of the Northern Arctic, and then on to the swamps of Louisiana, each time learning a little bit more about the mysterious travellers. This time, we end up in the Northern Territories of Canada. And yet again, our intrepid hero finds himself in the strange and mysterious world of Breach. So, my dear friends, it's time to enjoy Operation Thunderbird, episode 4 in this series. So, I think it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. Thane here. Now, this one was a little strange, relatively speaking. It was myself, Jeffreys, Barry, and Tanner again. The brass seemed to like us, together, even if we were smaller than a regular breach squad. So they started using us for the operations that didn't warrant a lot of loud noise and dead bodies. Results, as you'll see, tended to vary. We were being deployed at night to a remote location in the Northwest Territories. The big, black, nothing speeding beneath the osprey as the faintest tips of snow-covered trees glinted in whatever moonlight could slip through the clouds. By then, something had happened with the travellers. Those seismic readings we were getting from Libya were there for a reason, probably controlled detonations. We thought they were building some kind of underground outpost, and as far as I know, well, they still are. We sent UAVs and even some guys on the ground, and they couldn't find a way in, but that didn't necessarily surprise us. As far as we knew, they were so far beyond us that anything we did was likely to just antagonize them. And, well, there's only one thing you do to a mosquito on your arm. I heard people are getting paranoid, though, and started to consider more hostile options. I hope, for our future, that they don't. They made some minor improvements to our railguns this time, and not so minor improvements to their scopes. Since we could selectively power our shots between subsonic stealth and blow through 16 city blocks and kill somebody's cat, we now had the ability to track movement through walls, provided they weren't too thick. Unfortunately, our shitty cloaking field still made us look like discount predators, and our armor was truly uncomfortable. R&D was busy trying to counterfeit the self-replicating nanomachine tech from the Traveller, but stopped when they realized that their prototype nanomachines were about to turn the planet into <laughs> nanomachines. For this operation, we were also given what we were pretty sure was a bomb, packed in a featureless hexagonal cylinder with a little crease along the middle. It would pop open with a hiss, revealing a keypad and the black metal that shrouded the internals. Barry pointed out that there used to be a lettering on the inside, but it was intentionally scratched off. I don't know where they got it from, but it wasn't our tech. And a part of me doubts it even came from our planet. I only heard so much from the other squads, and there were some things they just wouldn't talk about. Eventually the sky began to flash with lightning, a massive storm brewing overhead that foretold our destination. Our objective was to infiltrate the compound of an organization called the Cult of the Veil, who had, apparently, made contact with an unknown deity, and traded something in exchange for an artifact that could summon storms. We knew this because a First Nations community had lived in the area for hundreds of years, and in the span of a day, was reduced to a flaming ruin. You could see the storm from space, like a cyclone had formed in the middle of a continent. As for why they gave us a bomb, well, they apparently came upon the information that the cult was establishing contact through a stable portal to another universe, so our job was to figure out how they were doing this and deliver the package, so to speak. We deployed about two clicks off from our destination, because any closer, the bird would get a zap from the sky. We were at least authorized to communicate with our handler at HQ this time, because unlike the Prometheus Mandate. A cult that was previously only known for huffing paint fumes wasn't going to intercept our calls. Looking through our night vision, 
we moved through the woods as quickly as we could, our armor insulating us from the cold as the sky flashed with lightning overhead. Barry led the way with his comms equipment, our cloaking fields shimmering upon the air as we passed through the trees. Slowly, the terrain began to rise as we moved up a mountainous incline. Large rocks jutting out of the snow as our armor carried us forward. Hold on, said Barry, his blur pointing at a section of stone that was chiseled flat and painted with a rune in dried blood. That's Elder Fulthark, a reversed Thurithas rune. Meaning? asked Jeffries. A lot of things, none of them good. Point being, it's an ancient Germanic alphabet that has no business being here so it's probably a marker put down by the cult. A marker for what? I asked. That. He disabled his cloaking module, and we looked at where he was pointing. The shadow, right there. I looked ahead, and saw a thin, black line tracing across the ground between the rocks, and then past them, disappearing into the distance. It didn't catch the light at all, even when the sky flashed with the storm. Sierra, this is Sierra One, said Jeffries. I think we've found some kind of ward. It's like a shadow, but it's just black. Barry says he's marked with a reversed Thurisaz rune. Please advise. Over. Sierra One, this is Sierra, said HQ. The ward is passable, but lethal if touched. Proceed over it, ensuring nothing, including debris, makes contact. Over. Roger, out, said Jeffries, moving forward as Barry reactivated his cloaking module. Carefully, Jeffries stepped over the shadow and surveyed the other side. We're good, he said. The rest of us followed, and as I stepped over the ward, I felt the air humming around me, like pins and needles on my skin. Keep an eye out for any more. I don't want to know what these things really do. Barry took the lead again, and we crept forward at a noticeably slower pace, searching the ground for wards with every step, as sleep began to patter against the trees overhead. Lights, said Barry, stopping to look through his scope. We moved up behind him, and I began to see the flicker of torchlight in the distance as the terrain leveled out, a powerful wind howling against us. I raised my gun peering through the scope and increasing the magnification to see the glowing outline of a man in robes, moving through the darkness beyond the trees. Jeffreys motioned us onward, and we crept closer until we could see the cultist in the torchlight that danced before the mouth of a cave. He was wearing the skull of a caribou, bleeding runes carved into his skin. Tanner, you're up, said Jeffreys. Oh, make it quiet. On it, said Tanner, moving ahead as we slowly followed behind, the wind and freezing sleet howling through the trees as the storm cracked overhead. Jeffrey signaled for us to stop, and we watched as the blur of Tanner crept up behind the man, who was stumbling and mumbling as though heavily intoxicated. Tanner jammed his knife into the base of the man's skull, cutting through his brainstem before catching his body and slowly easing it to the ground. Grabbing hold, Tanner dragged it off into the trees before rejoining us. The faint sound of a rasping song echoed from the cave beyond, warbling through a distorted pitch that could not have been produced by human vocal cords. Jeffries took point, and we followed him into the cave, the eldritch song reverberating through the torch-lit stone, runes slathered upon the flickering walls. Sawilo, said Barry. Sunlight or safety? Reassuring, said Tanner. As we continued onward, the tunnel slowly opened up into a wide cavern, filled with rows of tents crafted from the hides of animals, torches burning before them. In the centre of it all, hundreds of men and women sang the distorted song, naked and carved with twisting runes. Yet beyond their gaping mouths was only a starry blackness. They danced and swayed in a circle around a massive pile of books, and at the top, a man sat in a high chair, voraciously reading a massive tone as he twitched and shuddered in place. 
Behind him, a woman slowly massaged his skull, yet her finger seemed to sink into the bone, working through his brain as the man violently flipped to the next page, his frothing black saliva dripping from his chin. I'm not even going to ask, said Barry. There, I said, pointing as I noticed a massive obsidian archway at the end of the cavern, two guards standing before it with wooden staves as they deliriously wrapped their heads against the rock. We're going round, said Jeffries, as we carefully crept down the rock face. Keep it slow and stay behind cover. We don't want to catch their eyes. We followed behind him, making our way down to the cavern floor and taking cover behind a tent. A writhing, tentacled shadow stirred from within and began to cry like a human child. Wasting no time, we moved from tent to tent, slowly working our way to the end and then keeping low near the open archway. Look, said Barry, pointing at a massive ornate hammer that sat within the flames of a bonfire its gleaming surface sparking with electricity. I think that's it. Not our objective, said Jeffries. The cleanup crew will pick it up after the smoke's cleared. The man in the high chair started to yell something in another language, his barking intonation grating upon my ears. That's Danish, said Barry. Who the fuck are these people? What are they saying? asked Jeffries. Fill my skull, said Barry, sounding confused. The man was repeating the same thing over and over again. A high-pitched whine began to screech through the cavern, and I clenched my teeth in pain, and then it faded. The man stood up from his chair and made his way down from the pile of books, the crowd parting before him as his eyes split apart within their sockets, making way for several thin, spider-like legs that wrapped around the back of his head. The guards next to the archway rose from their stupor as the man strode with confidence toward them and disappeared into the chamber beyond, the guards shambling in his wake as they muttered incoherently in an excited tone. Move up, said Jeffries. We followed him into the chamber, which was crafted entirely from the bones of massive, inhuman arms winding together into a cradle of hands and long, tapered fingers. In the center, the skeletal design dipped into a black and fleshy pit that hummed with a sickening radiance. Slowly, the man crawled to his hands and knees and crept into the pit, disappearing into the darkness. The guard shambled back outside, where one collapsed to the ground and immediately fell asleep. My equipment's saying this is it, said Barry. Down there. We're really going to go in there? I asked. I think you know the answer to that, said Jeffries, getting onto his knees and crawling into the pit. For all we knew, it could have been a sacrificial altar that would kill us all before we even processed it. But we followed nonetheless. I went last slipping into the darkness as I slowly worked my way down across the fleshy walls. A strange, tingling sensation ran over my skin, and I suddenly felt the gravity reverse itself, like I was being pulled up into the sky. But I fought against it as my eyes met the light of day, and I climbed up onto the surface, nauseous and disoriented. Tanner grabbed my hand, helping me up, and I surveyed the world that now surrounded us. Switching my night vision off, I saw that it was daytime, and we now stood within a massive, circular library that seemed to tower forever into the sky. Beyond the marble pillars that surrounded us, the ruins of a city spanned to the horizon, and the sun looked as though it were slowly disintegrating, its glow overtaken by a creeping black malaise. A spiral staircase wound up on the walls that were lined with books all the way to the top, and upon it, the man with the legs jutting out from his eyes slowly made his way up the steps. Others rocked in delirium nearby, clutching their staves of winding wood. Far above, the library was open to a roiling, localized storm that flashed with lightning, yet 
through the blackened clouds, I almost thought I saw the shape of a massive crimson eye. My heart seizing in my chest as its gaze briefly fell upon me. The sky flashed again, revealing a spanning chasm of teeth that disappeared into the gale a second later. Something was up there. One of the men nearby started to scream and shout in Danish, brandishing his staff as he seemed to be looking straight at us. Can he see us? asked Barry. I don't. The staff flashed with light, and Jeffries was blown back against the wall with a thundering boom, his cloaking field crackling away as books rained down on him from above. I ducked just as the man turned to me, a bolt of lightning tearing overhead and lightened the shells aflame as I charged the capacitors of my gun and unloaded a uranium slug into his chest. The man was bisected by the round, blood and organs splattering against the tomes as the cultist from the cabins began to run up the steps, nearing the top. A low growl reverberated through the air as Jeffreys crawled to his feet, reactivating his cloaking module as it fizzled with distortion. Another cultist rose from behind the rubble that surrounded one of the pillars, slowly shambling toward us as he retched and twitched with insanity. Barry asked him something in Danish, leveling his gun at the man's chest. The cultist only continued forward, Barry repeating his question, until several long, spider-like limbs erupted from the man's mouth. Barry backed away, as Jeffrey shot the cultist with his railgun, blowing him back in a spatter of blood. We're not going to get anything out of these guys, said Barry. Let's finish this. Thane, set up the bomb, said Jeffries. As I took the bomb from my pack, a flash of lightning cracked from overhead as someone fired at us from the stairs, the blast igniting the ground as it barely missed me. Tanner opened fire on the enemy, who was clad in the blood-soaked skull of a caribou, which promptly exploded as a slug tore through it and blew the remains of the man against the wall, books clattering down from above. I opened the bomb and began to arm it, giving us sixteen minutes to get clear of the blast. An inhuman scream cried out from above and I looked up to see the man from the cavern being telekinetically lifted into the sky as a massive, suckered tentacle descended from the clouds. Latched onto the man's skull and bored inside, the fleshy appendage pulsating with hunger as it drank the knowledge from his mind. The bomb lit up as it was armed, and I locked it up, Jeffreys and Tanner firing at someone overhead. We're good, I said. All right. Get back, said Jeffreys, firing again with a loud bang as an arc of lightning lashed against the nearby wall, flaming pages blowing through the air. An enormous, misshapen hand descended from the heavens above, coated with a black gangrene as its claws slowly reached for us. The others fired at it, forcing it to flinch back as its flesh was blown away, the sky rolling with thunder. Hurry! I will cover you. I got onto my hands and knees, and quickly crawled back into the pit, as the others helped Jeffreys fight back the claws of the eldritch deity, their gunfire booming from above as I sank into the darkness, and switched on my night vision. The gravity reversed around me, and I eventually found myself crawling back up through the other side, rising to my feet in the cavern as Barry came through behind me. Tanner followed, and then Jeffreys his cloaking field malfunctioning from the massive burn stricken across his torso, where the metal of his armor melted into his skin. Hmm, looks like we'll be getting out the old-fashioned way, he said, charging the capacitors in his railgun as I took a grenade from my pack, the song of the cultist still rasping from the cavern beyond as another man twitched upon the chair. Sierra, this is Sierra One. We need to evac ASAP. Over. Sierra One, this is Sierra. Evac is inbound in three minutes. The coordinates have been forwarded to your navigator. Over. Roger. Out, said Jeffreys. Got him, said Barry, 
looking down at his map. Now let's get the fuck out of here, said Jeffries. Vane, you do the honors. My pleasure, I said. Ripping the pin from the grenade, I ran forward and tossed it into the ring of singing cultists as Tanner and Barry slit the guard's throats behind me. The grenade detonated, blowing several cultists to pieces as the rest were showered with burning shrapnel. The others opened fire with their railguns as we quickly advanced straight through the cavern, blasting holes in anyone we saw. A blinding pain cut through my nerves as a bolt of lightning struck me in the shoulder. My cloaking field crackling away as the man in robes began to charge another blast upon his staff, only to be decapitated as Tanner unloaded a round into his skull. A woman ran towards us with a knife in hand, screaming in a deranged madness. I charged my railgun and fired upon her, blowing her back across the cavern as her organ splattered against the tents that writhed with shadowy tentacles. Taking out another grenade as the others gunned down the cultist guards that fired upon them, I pulled out the pin and tossed it into one of the tents before whatever was inside could tear through the hide. It exploded a piercing childlike shriek echoing upon the stone as a flaming cacophony of tendrils and screaming mouths spilled across the ground, needling my mind with an aura of raw depravity as I struggled to keep my bleeding eyes on the nightmare. Contact, right, I yelled, my vision blurring in delirium. The others turned, unloading their railguns into the shrieking aberration before it could close the distance, and blowing it back as it quickly burnt to death upon the rocks. Reaching the end of the cavern, we ran up into the narrow cave, a bolt of lightning bursting against the ceiling above and raining sparks upon us. Slipping away, we hurried out of the cave as Barry took the lead, the sky flashing overhead as the storm of sleet lashed against us. We ran as quickly as we could, and I glanced back to see the flickering lights of the cultists in the distance, slowly beginning their pursuit. Stop! yelled Barry, stumbling to a halt as he pointed out the ward that was stricken across the ground. Carefully, he stepped over it, and we did the same, just as a cultist wielding a massive knife came screaming out of the forest behind us, his face carved with bleeding runes. We didn't even get to fire before he stepped on his own ward. All I heard was a sickening crunch, a splatter of blood smacking against me as he was sucked into the shadow within a split second. Barry, said Jeffries, when we get back, remind me to buy you a beer. <laughs> yes, sir, said Barry, continuing forward as the lights of the cultists drew closer in the distance. As we made our way down the incline, a light gleamed from overhead as the sound of an osprey cut through the storm, hovering above us as the wind lashed against it. The M240 gunner tossed down a rope before opening fire on the advancing cultists. We began to climb it, the strength of my armor carrying me up as I gripped the cord tight, and pulled myself up into the helicopter, joining with the others as the gunner fired another burst. As we sped away, I could see the lights of the cultists below. Yet before they could try to shoot us down, a blinding flash cancelled the night. The hill that contained the Eldridge Cavern erupted in a massive explosion, throwing off a tremendous shockwave that blew back the trees and lit them aflame. The Osprey shook as we rose into the clouds, speeding away as quick as we could, and I looked back to see the remnants of a fiery mushroom cloud, scorching the sky with a deep orange. I swore, my body still shaking as a numbing pain coursed through my skull. As the others took off their masks, I saw that they were feeling the same, slumped back against the interior of the helicopter as they struggled to catch their breath. When I became more lucid and the adrenaline wore off, I began to wonder how the Canadian government was going to explain away the detonation of a nuclear bomb. Then again, until I came along, Breach was always good at keeping things quiet, and blaming seismic events on fracking was a favourite of theirs much to the displeasure of the petroleum industry. Some other teams went back to clean up the mess, but thanks to everything being vaporized, 
They didn't find anything out of note beyond the hammer. And yes, they're calling it Mjolnir. It's currently powering another outpost that's being used for the development of an artificial intelligence, on account of them being too terrified to even touch the Traveler's antimatter core. Speaking of covering things up, I got a visit today, just not at my apartment. There's a special kind of, oh shit, that you feel when you get cornered in an alley by four guys with submachine guns. Turns out that they don't particularly care about me running my mouth, because anyone that's heard of these is under the impression that they're works of fiction. They do want to keep an eye on me, though, in a very close and personal way. I'll be joining my old squad, for whatever it's worth, and they made it clear that it wasn't a request. I can't say I'm looking forward to it. Camaraderie was great, but at the end of the day, I got out because my mind was starting to break. Nobody's meant to see the things we've seen, and if something major is about to happen, I'd rather be freezing in Alaska than fighting on the front lines. I heard another small town got overrun by the roots in North Dakota. They firebombed the whole place and removed any trace of it from the internet, like it never even existed. Here's hoping they figure out how to stop it. Next up, if I'm still breathing, I'll tell you about the one in Egypt. An archaeologist found a hidden passage in KV-62, the tomb of Tutankhamun, and it led to an upside-down version of Earth. Until then, thanks for listening. Oh, and don't drink the tap water. Well, there we go, episode four in the series. Hope you're enjoying these as much as I am. A lot of positive comments coming back for each of these videos, so pleased to say that episode 5 is written and will be with you sometime before the new year. Well, if I get around to it. <laughs> Plan to keep going through the uh, holiday period, so hope you'll stick with me and enjoy the videos before we embark on 2019. Well, that's definitely enough for me for one evening. So until next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>